a god with a broken neck. The first night you don't come home, summer rains shake the clematis. I bury the dead moth I found in our bed, scratch up a rutabaga and eat it rough with dirt. The dog finds me and presents between his gentle teeth a twitching night jar. In her panic, she sings in his mouth. He gives me her pain like a gift, and I take it. I hear the cries of her young, greedy with need, expecting her return, but I don't let her go until I get into the house. I take the auspices. The way she flutters against the wallpaper's moldy roses means all can be lost. How she skims the ceiling means a storm approaches. You should see her in the beginnings of her fear, rushing at the starless window, her body a dart, her body the arrow of longing, aimed, as all desperate things are, to crash, not into the object of desire, but into the darkness behind it. Dueling sonnets on the railroad tracks. Don't admit anything. Don't ask your question. I tasted her sweat on your knuckles, her whispers in your mouth like secondhand smoke. I've wandered north to the railroad tracks, throwing gravel at the cars. The small violence comforts me. I never told you I met a man where honeysuckle withers against the streetlight. We walked the deserted rail yards, talking about love and its difficulties without ever touching each other. But don't you think I wanted him to push me against the abandoned cars, rust and friction bruising my backbone as he tugged at my zipper with his teeth? Not for the rushed and furious pleasure of it, but because if I could hurt you now, I could forgive you, and forgiveness is all that makes love safe. The summer we met, bull sharks cruised the coastal shelf at dusk. Thunderstorms startled each afternoon bright and unforgiving. We closed the lifeguard stand, and I held the rafters, and you held my hips, and we never learned how light we found the earth. How did it come to this? The raccoon troubling the garbage cans, a blooming apple tree sheltering a nest of dead birds, the train wailing in the distance. I know I will come home, and we will punish each other long enough to outlast desire. While you pretend to sleep, I will pack quietly and whisper, electrons. When the storm wants to strike, something in the earth rises up. But you already knew that, didn't you? You already knew the tree was the answer to the lightning's question. O oh, God in which the bats tried to warn me. You used to recite the parts of my body like psalms. I should have known when you started to kiss with your eyes closed that your mouth would ruin us. And I should have known when you slipped belladonna in my buttonholes, when you started to bring me empty boxes, when I found her dog asleep under our house. She told me about someone she'd been sleeping with, and the someone was you. At first, I didn't tell you I knew. I came home, and you were slicing rhubarb and strawberries. You put sugared hands on my neck and kissed my forehead. No, it happened like this. When you fucked me, I could feel how much you hated me. And you came, and I came twice. You stayed on top and softened inside me as you kissed my shoulders. I stayed awake to watch you sleep, and thought about the stories your parents told about you. The wildfire you started. How you broke your mother's birdhouses. How your father paid you to kill bats, a dollar a body. Last summer, you let me watch. As you waited with the racket, timber wolves announced the room. Bats crept out of the attic. The soft pulp of their body struck the house. Your father swatted your back, handed you five bucks, and I went to pick up the bodies. One still shuddered against the center block. I should have left, but I didn't. I crushed its head with a rock and tossed it into the woods and went inside and washed my hands and lied to you.
don't read any more of those. <laughs> I can't say it gets happier or that things stop dying in the poems, but they won't be that, they won't be that sad, maybe. No promises, no promises. But I'll say penis again just because I thought it was over and it's still not. It's still there. It's still there. Um, so the two things I guess I'll say about this poem is um, in the title it's Echolalia St. Armand's Key. And St. Armand's Key is a beach on the Gulf Coast of Florida. And Echolalia is the sound of baby, so baby talk and baby babble is actually called Echolalia because it's the sounds they're making and repeating back to you as they're trying to form language and they think they're telling you something, but that's what they're trying to do anyway. Um, and there's a, a moment in, in the poem in which it talks about believers being buried in, in the ocean. Um, and that's not something that we're used to here, but in Japan, when missionaries first came over, one of the ways in which they were tortured or converts were tortured was that they were tied to stakes, buried in the sand uh, at low tide, so that when the tide came up, um, it would be a slow death that they would have to wait for, and everybody on shore would watch everybody die. Um, read that in a book, and I can't remember where, but I, I think it's true. And if not, it's in the poem, so that makes it true. So. So it's there. Echolalia, St. Armand's Key. When I put my hand in the ocean, I can hear whales cry to each other. In the deep, a mother clicks to her calf, and the calf sings its mother's sadness back to her. August singes our shoulders, and you tell me the world is after you again. Another car accident, and more body parts failing. You hold out your arms and ask what you've done to deserve this. Why God would hurt his children so? Why don't you see the shark's teeth and starfish at your feet and know that the world will always return? You want me to say you're right, you're being punished, and I am another arrow in your ribs, another flame you can't walk out of. Believers used to be buried in the ocean, you say, tied to stakes in sand, crying out as the waves rose. Families on shore listened to what the condemned asked God for as they died, their wild lamentations and blue dark prayers. The water returns for you and you pull up your feet. The body cannot bear what it used to be. I want to be careful with your weakness, so I sing your songs back to you. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there, even in the darkness. Praise bone spurs on your spine. Praise the weak alveoli in your lungs, because our suffering is holy and not holy, and all we have. And because I apparently like obscure titles, um, this one is in Latin, and it's Fiat Lux, which is Let There Be Light. My sister asks what ate the bird's eyes as she cradles the dead chickadee she found on the porch. Ants. I say, knowing the soft ocular cells are the easiest way into the red feast of heart, liver, kidney. I tell her that when they ate the bird, they saw the blue, bold sky, the patchwork of soybean fields and sunflowers, a bear loping across a gravel road. Already they are bringing back to their tunnels the slow chapters of spring, a slough drying to become a meadow, and the bruised smell of sex inside flowers. They start to itch for a mate's black feathered throat in music. As she cushions the eggs, their queen dreams of young chickadees stretching their necks and crying for their mothers to protect them until they learn to see. Sister, it is like this. The visions begin to waver, and the colony goes mad, fearful they'll never see another Dahlia tell its purple rumor or see a river commit itself to the ocean. As the last memory leaves them, they twitch in their sleep, trying to make out the distant boatman lifting his lantern, his face disfigured by light. The light in the basement. Do you ever see a train coming and want to step in front of it, you ask? watching the light book around the tunnel's curve. The train speed pushes its fingers up the sleeves of our coats, and its wheels breaking on the cold rails takes away my answer. 
and I don't know why, when the Colossus reaches for you, you want to be caught, held in the grip of a silver darkness, and peeled from your body and all the muscles you never understood. And I don't know why, when I see the scars on my friend's arm, I want to take off her watch and keep time from her and hold her wrists to my cheeks. I don't know why the moon sometimes looks like a pill, why I grow careless cooking and shaving. And I think of the neighbor who failed to show up one night to watch me. My father tried her phone, her bell, her door, and seeing her basement light on pressed his belly to the grass and saw her closed face, her body tied to water pipes with an electric wire. Both shoes slipped from her toes and lay waiting, as though the shadows of her feet could crawl into them and take her upstairs. Do you ever see a train coming and want to step in front of it? I don't want to tell you the truth. I want to tell you the right answer, the way I tell my friend I am stronger than her left arm or her family, the way my father came home and held my mother and pushed her curls behind her ears and said, that kind of loneliness is dangerous. And my hand is alone in your hand, and the answer is yes. say thanks again for coming out and letting me say penis in front of you. And Nick, for the wonderful introductions, and Anne, we've got to spend a couple nights together, do a couple readings together, and we first met at a reading, and I came with her a couple years ago to hear her read at Bunk, and it's a real pleasure to get to be back and get to be doing it together. So, um, my birthday is tomorrow. Yay! Thanks, Mama, for the cushion. <laughs> and um, actually, it was a few years ago my grandmother sent me my death date in my birthday card. Um, because she's an eschatologist, she's been predicting the end of the world since I was a child. But she's like, this is it, I know the day, and I can't tell you. But it's, no one's guessed right. My grandma knows, no one has guessed right yet. But um, I know, it's not on my birthday, but but she told me when I was going to die to be prepared. So that was, that was her birthday present to me a few years ago. And so I wrote this poem. Thanks, Grandma. Um, so it's called Prayer for Sunlight and Hunger. On my birthday, my grandmother announces the angels are upstairs, sharpening their wings, preparing for war. We must ready ourselves for the Messiah's return when he will ride out of the sky in all of his terrible splendor to destroy us. We must watch the moon, the pale harbinger of resurrection for signs. She has warned us since childhood, and the years passed and passed and passed as the abacus lit beads for the apocalypse. Every Sabbath we grow lunar, delirious, waiting for the eclipse. And every year I dread the messengers coming, like the two strange angels who come to me in dreams, put their hands on my shoulders and say, Behold what you are, a cardinal in snow, fog in the trees at dawn, a lamb bringing a dead shepherd a crown of thistles. But tonight we toast to salvation and pray for another year of needs and mistakes. My Lord, my heart is insatiable. Leave me here among the ordinary wonders. I would miss the sound of birds under my window in the morning singing about sunlight and hunger. I would miss the smell of bread rising and dancing barefoot to the silence while my lover sleeps. I want to eat the pound cake and peaches on my plate and hug my mother so I can smell the powder on her neck. I want to pick wild blueberries. I want to swim in three oceans to see an avalanche from a distance and have terror bring my soul to the surface of my body. Loneliness is the worst kind of freedom, and I am full of gratitude for the man who kissed me against a brick wall, for the man who pulled back my hair and whispered to my clavicles, and for the one who read me Ovid as I undressed. I know there is beauty we must die to reach, but I have come this far, and there are crumbs on the table and wine in my glass. The moon is full, and tonight the sky looks wide, wild, and endless.